It used to be hard to find the exact auto parts you needed, and that meant spending a lot of time at swap meets. It's a different game now when you can order exactly what you need from eBay Motors. They have 122 million parts, so you can always find the right fitment. Spend less time searching and more time building with the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. And then you decide, well, I'm up here. I got to look over this thing and see what it looks down. And you look down to life-threatening exposure and you realize, you know, I'm on the edge of a mountain here, man. This is exhilarating and scary as hell. And it was both exhilarating and scary as hell. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason, and today is a throwback episode because I have the day off. It is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I'm spending it with my family, celebrating uh, the life of Martin Luther King Jr., and I'm trying to take some time to be with them. But I do appreciate you tuning in today, and we've got a really interesting episode. It's it's Craig Dinkle, and he, it, you know, he as you're going to hear when Travis introduces him, because this is a throwback sh- uh, episode to quite a few years ago. Uh, he is a well-rounded, highly successful person who has has had many interests, many endeavors in life. So. I always love hearing from people like this about how they tick and how they're able to succeed in so many areas of life. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you learn something. This is a really long episode. So if you've got a drive ahead of you or uh, just some time today, uh, it's going to be hopefully plenty of content to keep you excited and uh, keep you motivated for your next adventure. All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is your host, Travis. With me today is Craig Dinkle. As a young child, Craig's adventure life began with a near drowning at a very young age of two. But instead of this experience leaving him with a fear of water, Craig ultimately became an excellent swimmer competing for Cal State and qualifying for the Olympic trials. He's an entrepreneur, having grown a company from ground level into a half billion dollar market, only to have it wiped out by the dot com crash. Craig eventually found himself summoning 13,775-foot Grand Teton in Wyoming and ultimately catching the bug to attempt a through-hike of the Continental Divide Trail. We'll talk all about this and a little bit more on today's show. So, Craig, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Hi. Thanks for having me. It's a blast to be here. Thank you. Glad to have you, man. So, yeah, I was reading over your bio, and uh, wow. I mean, just the the intro alludes to um, such a small fraction of what you've done. It's uh, it's neat to see all of these uh, these bullet points. So let's dig in and, and start with that uh, that point in life where at two years old you found yourself uh, you know under under some water and uh, and in in a bad situation. So what's how did that come about? Yeah, I, I, I'm not even sure qu- quite how that came about. We were uh, New England born and raised, and uh, at uh, about two years of age, we moved out to California. My father was transferred to uh, same company, but to uh, you know, different location. So we moved up to Santa Barbara. And um, all I remember is, uh, you know, one day we were on a pool deck somewhere, you know, family outing, um, public pool. And I, I can remember uh, slipping into the shallow end. You know, I was uh, I was pretty mobile and agile two-year-old. I guess these days, you know, with the helicopter parents and everyone paying so close attention to their kids, what I'm about to tell you is sort of blasphemy by today's standards. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the way things were in those days. And uh, uh, parents were a little more hands-off. So uh, so hands-off that I decided to test out the water for myself, and I slipped myself into the shallow end. And it was shallow enough that I could walk around and bounce around. But I was bouncing myself toward the deep end. I can remember sort of floating off into, you know, mid pool where uh, toward the deep end where it was, you know, way over my head and um, just lost control of everything and drowning up against the wall of the pool. I was sort of like, you know, just the way you'd sort of imagine it, arms flailing and splashing, but hitting the side of the pool, but and taking in a whole bunch of water at that point. And um, um, I could see things around me. 
by the way, drowning isn't painful. <laughs> I can, yeah, That's sorry. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's not painful. You're just taking a bunch of water and you don't really feel anything, I guess. Uh, uh, but I must not have done it for too long. I could see out of the corner of my eye my older brother, who was then only five years old and, and already a good swimmer. Swimming just seems to run in our blood here. And uh, uh, he dived in from the deep end and uh, swam over to me and was able to somehow leverage me out of the pool and into my, my mother's arms. And uh, the last thing I remember about that was, uh, you know, there was no major urgency or crazy yelling or screaming or panic going on on the pool deck. My mother was holding me and, um, you know, not comforting me. Uh, I didn't I didn't feel like anything had happened, really, like not anything more than falling over and stubbing a toe or something like that. It didn't seem like a big event to me because no one was acting like it was a big event. But uh, there my mother was holding me. And the last thing I really remember about that was upheaving a whole bunch of water, clearing that out. And um, we left the pool deck and that day fades away. That's all I remember about that. But I do remember the act of drowning. And I don't I don't recommend it uh, for most people, probably for anybody. No, no, not at all. Man, and to have that experience when you're two years old, I can't remember a single thing from when I was two years old. And you probably don't, except for this one event. And the fact that that lives so vividly in your memories, uh, it's pretty amazing. That's a vivid one. I can almost see the whole thing as if I'm looking you know, at it um, you know, from a distance. Um, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting, and it's good that I can remember it. Uh, I guess I guess there's no way you could forget it, even if you're only two years old. It's such a profound experience, and you and you you uh, you know what's going on. Uh, right. So it, so it sticks with you. It's it, look at it was. Uh, I'm glad I made it through. I'm glad my brother was there. I'm glad he could swim at five years old, and I'm glad that I wasn't uh, wasn't found on the bottom of the pool because those things happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it absolutely does. Well, it I imagine it gave you a good healthy sense of uh, of a healthy sense of fear and self-preservation moving on through, through life at that point. That's a, that's a very early age to figure that out. You know, I don't know. Uh, it's a darn good question. I, I never really thought of it from that point of view. Um, I think because um, there was no panic, there was no crazy um, behavior, you know, uh, going on from my parents on the pool deck. Um, and uh, and because it was managed in a non-emergency like mode with what I would even still today say otherwise, <laughs> because they weren't keeping an eye on me. So I, I say I do say otherwise, you know, responsible, level headed parents. My my mother had an IQ of 160 and my father's no dummy either. So they're they're pretty bright people. Um, but but so they, they handled it more, uh, I think, level headed. They understood what was happening. And and I don't think I had any real fear instilled in me uh, as, as a result of it. So I think going forward from that point, the things that I liked to do, whether it was mountain climbing or rock climbing or uh, uh, whatever came next, um, um, you know, I, I, they, they never really bothered me. I was always eager to try new things. Now, I have not donned and I don't intend to don one of those flying suits that people, you know, wear. <laughs> <laughs> I do have my limits. I do have my boundaries. And uh, that's that's something that uh, that doesn't appeal to me. But uh, I haven't bungee jumped and I've always wanted to do that. I know that probably seems like nothing these days, but um, uh, it still looks like a fun thing for me to do. I haven't done that. And I don't think uh, for the longest time I didn't think I'd parachute, but I think I do that now. That seems like a bit of a risky endeavor to me. But, you know, people survive that, too. That's that's probably not that big a deal. But. I don't think I have the usual sort of fears that people have when it comes to doing things unless you unless I really think I may be trading my life for the experience in which case I'm pretty much not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you might have yeah, you might have gotten the uh the exact inverse of that actually. What what that might have taught you is that, you know, things can get pretty bad and you know what? I lived through it and I, you know, people were calm about it and we made it through that event, so uh, presumably I can make it through other events too. Like you said, without, you know, putting yourself in really dumb situations and taking risks all the time, then, uh, then that is healthy. Yeah, I think so. And I think in that regard, I'm lucky. You actually went on and like you said, you excelled in, in swimming. You became a certified scuba diver quite young and you, um, set some records and, uh, and competed, uh, at Cal state for swimming. So go into that a little bit, uh, some achievements there. Well, I had a brother, uh, the, the one, in fact, who saved my life. He became a swimmer later. We had moved back to New England, and um, and he found his way into swimming. I don't know how. I never asked him. He just found his way into swimming. And um, 
uh, I idolized him. Uh, he was a great brother. They're, all my brothers are great. I love them all, but but he was a very special guy to me. Probably struck a very close bond because of that experience. Very young, so we we were very very close. And he became a swimmer, and I just sort of followed him into swimming. And um, um, I think I was lucky to tell you the truth. I I think I just sort of discovered uh, an ability that I I didn't know I had, and sort of in many ways lucked into. Um, I just lucked into a sport that I ended up being good at, um, and I, I set my um, set my first record at 15 years old. Where, where we grew up, there was the local, and probably every town and every every uh, uh, state in the union here, you know, there's their version of Michael Phelps or Mark Spitz or you know Bolt, any one of these great athletes at the regional level. And uh, we had our regional level, you know, Michael Phelps, great guy. Uh, could swim anything, was very fast um, and very good. He was three years older than me. And um, one day, I, you know, one day I just popped into a swim meet for no good reason. I hadn't really trained. I hadn't done much of anything. In those days, our workouts were sometimes the width of the pool, not the length of the pool, which sounds crazy. But New England didn't have it together where I was in terms of you know great coaches, great stroke coaches, and and. Uh, uh, you know, great programs, you know, they were just figuring it all out. So that's sort of the program I was in and came from. But I showed up haphazardly one day at a meet because I had nothing better to do. And I broke I broke his record. And I thought to myself, wow, well, this doesn't really make much sense here that I could break this guy's record. He's the best. And I'm I'm just a guy in the pool. <laughs> uh, and so I just made a note of it and thought, well, maybe I better pay attention to this. This is something maybe I can do. Um, and as fate would have it, uh, a year later, we moved to California, and I landed in Thousand Oaks, which in at that time was one of the right places in California to land. Uh, Mission Viejo is a great spot, San Diego, Northern Cal. But basically, if you landed in California as a swimmer when I was there, you probably were going to land in a good spot, and I did. Um, and uh, I found out what it meant to be a really good swimmer right away. Um, uh, well, almost straight away. I didn't swim at all. I quit swimming when I got to California because I didn't enjoy the move. I didn't like it. I was happy where I was. And uh, what happened was uh, I just decided to abandon the project altogether. But I got I got nudged back into the pool late uh, in my sophomore year and uh, and was a full time swimmer again uh, in my junior and senior years. And so in my junior year. Um, I dropped seven seconds and a hundred. I was a I was a sprint freestyler, uh, hundred yard free, fifty free, hundred yard fly were my main events, and uh, I was completely uncompetitive. I was no one was going to be frightened of me. Um, I had no background and whatever I was in New England, you know, came crashing down on me in California. No one was frightened of me, and no one, no one would would even pay any attention to me to be frightened of me. So, uh, as a as a competitor, so. Um, but I didn't care. You know, I just got in the pool and started training and working out and now a real program. Um, and at the end of my junior year, I was very competitive. I dropped seven seconds um, in my 100-yard freestyle, which is a massive drop for a sprint. It's a very, very big drop. And I went from being absolutely not on the competitive curve to being competitive and interesting, but still not a threat to a soul. Um um, and then my senior year came and of course I, I paid heavy dues and I thought, well, if I could drop seven seconds like that, you know, maybe I could be competitive. And by the end of my senior year, um, in California, they call it CIF, um, which is the equivalent to division one, NC2A division one at the high school level. Um, I was in the highest division for that. And I, um, I dropped four more seconds in my hundred, which, which put me sixth in the world at that time. And but the real standout swim was my 50 meter sprint, which at the end of that competition put me number two in the world. So things happened very quickly, you know, from 15, you know, not complete, 15 and 16, not competing at 17 at all, training or anything, and then going back to the water through the years of 18 and 19, um, uh, things just sort of clicked and worked out for me. So uh, between high school and college, I ended up with. Um, 23 All-Americans, um, four NC2A records, and um, I was the fastest inductee into my Collegiate Hall of Fame, um, qualified for two Olympic trials. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's, I guess I should stop somewhere, huh?
<laughs> wow, that's a that's an amazing story. I mean, what a what a rapid rise, you know. Like I said, for for somebody that started their life out just about drowning in a pool to uh, to make those accomplishments in in swimming, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I I um I never take any of it for granted. I I really do think that um, I was lucky. Yeah, no doubt. Let's transition from being underwater to uh, many thousand feet up in the air. You were reading uh, Into Thin Air, and that kind of instilled a little bit of a, a bug into you, or I should maybe a curiosity about uh, mountain climbing. Um, tell me about that. How did you end up going down the path of wanting to complete the, the CDT? I mean, this is 3,100 miles of, of hiking and some pretty seriously high peaks along the way. So what, uh, what launched you down that road? Yeah. Okay. I was, you know, profoundly aware as most people are who pay attention to outdoor adventures when in 1996, that major disaster on Everest happened where I don't remember the number of people, but eight, nine, 10, 11 people died, maybe more in this massive storm that, that came in. And, you know, I thought, well, oh my God, what happened here? What, what's the story? How does this happen? And so I picked up Krakauer's book and I read the book. And when I read the book, I thought, these guys are insane. What? Who does this? Who who climbs thirty thousand feet and you know takes three weeks to get to base camp and a, and a week or two to get just to just to Tibet and and prepare and uh, then hike up the base camp and the the trek along the way just to get to base camp? You know, look at if you did nothing in your life but hike to base camp. You'd be an elite athlete in my mind. That's a piece of work right there. That's impressive. If you if you told me you hiked the base camp, my, my my hat would come off. I'd salute you. That's a hard piece of work. Now, you know what it takes to go from base camp to the summit is just a whole another level of insanity and craziness. And what struck me in into thin air was that year, and I think this is often the case. There was an overwhelming handful of people utterly unqualified to be there completely, totally, and un utterly unqualified to be there. And when I read about their background and, you know, who they were and what they did for a living and uh, the gear that they bought, and some of the people were taking out their gear on, on, on a chopper flight over, you know, when they land at the airport and they fly over to wherever the staging, the initial staging area is to go up to base camp, Krakauer was recounting how people were opening up boxes of gear on the plane that they were going to be putting on for the first time. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, crazy stuff. So, so right away I was shaking my head, but it gets way, way worse. I mean, I, I don't want to spoil the story. Uh, I'll just add that Believe it or not, it's true. You can read it. It's a matter of fact. But one person even went so far as to to haul uh, their own personal cappuccino machine up to base camp. And I viewed the whole thing as completely disrespectful of what the mountain asks of you, what skydiving asks of you, what any sport that's 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 hard, really hard, is going to ask of you. And you've got people bringing cappuccino machines up to base camp. You've got people who don't really understand what they're up against, but maybe arguably worse, you've got leaders that have to be called into question too, that would allow this sort of thing. Um, that's a whole nother debate for another time. Um, but that's one of the reasons I recommend the book because it's an incredible read. It explains the story from crack hours point of view, which I think is a good one. Um, and it, it really explains the kind of people both qualified and not that were there and, how they managed this whole event. And I was just struck by the gravity of the event, the storm that hit, the people that got killed, um, the people that survived. Um, and so the whole the whole totality of this, what I'm telling you, struck me as who do this? What what kind of people do this? This is crazy. I thought I was crazy. I'm not doing anything crazy. And I thought I'd, I'd never do anything like this. But you know, I finished the book, I put it down, I went about my business, and it kept gnawing at me. And because my brother is a, um, a, a high-level mountain climber, I, I don't know, maybe three months later I called him and said, okay, I, I yield. Um, I don't want to go up K2. I have no desire to hit Everest. I don't want to do anything insane. I'm an inexperienced – inexperienced isn't even the right word. Novice is probably the right word, you know, mountain climber. And this is what you've done since you were 15, so I want you and your, your climbing partner to – you know, take me up the grand with you. And so, so I can kind of get an idea anyway, you know, sort of get a glimpse into what that world is like. And so that's how, uh, in, into thin air struck me. And that's how I ended up, 
um, ultimately summiting the grand after two failed attempts and succeeding on the third. Um, um, and this is Grand Teton in, uh, yeah. in Wyoming. Yeah, Grand Teton, Jackson, Wyoming. Um, beautiful, beautiful mountain. I suggest everyone do it. It did take me three times to get there. I, I didn't train properly the first two times. I didn't know what I was up against. And uh, my brother said, just show up. You know, you're a former world-class athlete. You'll be great. You'll be fine. And so I <laughs> foolishly listened to him and paid a deep, dear, serious price for that. Um, mountain just laughed at me and spit me off it. And um, – I had to leave that trip because I was I was incapacitated from it. It was it was it was a hard effort. Um, it didn't work out that year, but eventually it worked out. So, what was it that uh, beat you up so much about it? I mean, you were a, a trained athlete, and you know somebody. Most people would say, "Well, yeah, I can see you know where you would be fine in that environment." So, what was it that you really struggled with? Well, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good. Qu- it's a fair enough question. Um, <laughs> when when my brother said that to me. He goes, oh, don't, don't worry about training. You'll be fine. He was remembering who I was as an athlete. You know, when he knew me as a high level athlete, I was ripped and fit and strong and had a massive cardio, um, capacity, which I, even today on my x-rays, when I get my occasional physicals, my doctor always says, and there are your lungs. They're bigger than normal. As I always tell you from, from all the aerobic work you've done. Um, um, but he was remembering a time that had passed at the, at the time I was wanting to do this. I was running a dot com company back in the nineties or actually it was, um, 2001. It was just before nine 11. It was the summer of 2001 that I did it. Um, I think I did it the first time and, um, I kind of listened to him. I know better. I, I knew better. I know that you don't go into any event, whatever it is that's, that requires physical, um, exertion without, training for it. But for some reason, I figured, well, this is his world. He he knows me. He knows his world. Yeah, well, I'll hike a little bit. <laughs> so I was in California and, uh, you know, I, I hiked a half a dozen times, you know, with a little bit of weight on my back and figured, okay, I'm ready to go. And when I got to Wyoming to do that trip, they stacked about 50 pounds on my back, which I didn't have at all. You know, <laughs> you know. Oh, that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You didn't tell me I was going to have 50 pounds on my back. And, um, of course, I did, again, I concede, you know, naivety and ignorance. I, I didn't know this, and they could have, you know, planned a little better with me. And I think we all took some things for granted, as serious as, as this sort of thing is. They, they sort of had one view of me, and I had a view of them, and uh, we didn't connect on it. You know, we didn't connect on it. They, they just figured I'd be okay. And, 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 uh, so yeah, 50 pounds on my back and, uh, we first rented a canoe and I could, you know, there's three of us and I was so out of shape at that time. I couldn't, I couldn't even hold my hands over my head to help the, them carry the canoe. That's sort of, you know, an early warning that things weren't going to work out yeah, so right. well. <laughs> right. I knew no exaggeration within 10 steps of going up this steep scree laden mountain called Mount Moran that I was out of shape, that I was in trouble, that this was going to be a completely inglorious event and that the only way to get through it and not ruin their vacation was to just zip my mouth shut and just endure the pain, which I did. (laughs) And fortunately for me, they had not, uh, I don't know if they got an out of date book or the wrong book and we had chosen the wrong window of opportunity to actually make the technical climb from hiking to the technical climb and we couldn't do it and we were pretty high up there we'd spent one night um before we had moved to technical gear and we just recognized that the amount of time left in that day um we weren't going to make it they had miscalculated they're they are professionals and they did respect the window and privately they said well outwardly they said gee you know we're not going to be able to do this climb we have to go back down now because we've only got a week to do three climbs now we have to move over to middle teton so so we spent one more night on the mountain you know walked down uh the next day and um by the time i'd gotten to the bottom before i'd gotten to the bottom i already had to transfer half of my weight it was just embarrassing to admit but my brother's uh, climbing partner um had a bad hip and you know had a limp and walked with um uh, poles, you know, climbing poles, hiking poles, very accomplished climber. So been there, done that, knows what he's doing. But he was running into some hip issues uh, at that point in his life. But it didn't matter. I still had to give him at least 30 pounds of the weight uh, to for me to just get off the mountain because turning around and going down is a whole different physical experience and going up. Um, and I couldn't handle it. My legs were rubber at that point. And this was the first time in my life 
that it was the old one foot in front of the other, just pick pick a goal of five steps, ten steps, and there's going to be a thousand of those just to get off the mountain. But yeah. don't think, yeah, right. So don't think in terms of a thousand. Just think in terms of a thousand times, you know, ten at a time. And, and that's how I did it. Um, he took that weight. They got down the mountain fine. I came down behind them. And by the time I hit the bottom, I could I could hardly stand. I was out of shape, as I was telling you. And I let my brother tell me that uh, I'd have no problem. I had an immense problem. I, I limped for a week after that, and I had to opt. I had to opt out of the other two climbs because I just couldn't do them physically. Yeah, I can uh, completely relate to your story about that. If you're not with the the right people, I mean, they could be great guides, but if they don't know you and your shape or limitations, um, you know, it can be a, a really disappointing experience. My first time ever climbing a 14er was Long's Peak here in Colorado. Um but the guy I had gone with was gung ho and, you know, just made some assumptions about me. You know, I grew up in New England with you at, at sea level and uh and moved out here and I I was acclimated to Colorado but not doing fourteen thousand foot peaks. So he said, You wanna climb Long's Peak? I said, Sure, why not? Let's go do it. You know, I put my my faith and trust in him. Well, the guy uh you know, we decided to to summit Meeker, which is just uh south of Long's Peak, and then he for some reason thought that you could just go down in the saddle and up and summit longs, you know, bag two peaks at the same time. Well, he was sorely mistaken and we ended up having to <laughs> go, you know, pretty much like two thirds of the way back down Long's Peak just to come around the other side and summit it again. And again, this is my my first time ever climbing a 14er. And you oh. talk about those little baby steps, you know, one, two, you know, and just trying not to stumble. And that was my experience coming down off of that. And you go through the narrows of Long's Peak, of course, you know, a stumble could end, you know, wind you up a thousand feet down the, the cliff in a, in a heartbeat. So it was the most uh, exhausting thing I've ever done because of the route that we took. And, you know, you can really turn people off of, of any adventure sports oh, that way if you're not careful. Absolutely. I totally empathize. You just hit, I empathize deeply with you. I know just how you felt. That's how I felt. And you said something really interesting there that I didn't even touch on. You know, you're, I'm just talking about the hike and going up scree and, you know, the technical climb failing and obeying the window and going back down. We did all the right things, but I didn't even begin to discuss what you just pointed out and even mention exposure. I mean, at, at, at a spot here, at a spot here, you're looking at a thousand feet down. If you slip and fall the wrong way, you're, you're SOL. You're in mm -hmm. big trouble. Yeah. So, uh, I know what you went through and, uh, Long's Peak is a, is a, is a pretty tough mountain. I, I don't know much of it, but I've somehow stumbled upon it recently. Um, that's a pretty strong mountain to climb, is it not? Yeah, it is. And of course, the, it depends on the route that you take. There's, you can make it as difficult as you want. Um, you know, but this guy did not take the, the newbie up the, the route that he should have taken me. Unfortunately, he wasn't as educated as I, I had trusted that he was. <laughs> it, it didn't ruin my experience. I've gone to, on to climb other 14ers and I enjoy them. But, uh, but yeah, it just, the point being is you really got to, one, you got to know yourself. You got to know your limitations. You also need to know when to stop, turn around and regroup, you know, like you learned, you know, you could have benefited from, from stopping and regrouping and maybe tackling it another day. But, you know, it never, it just depends on the person and how the, uh, how that uh, turns out in the end. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. You know, on this show, we talk a lot about the adventure, but it's honestly the time between the adventure that is most important, being adventure ready, as we say. And the most important aspect of that is knowing your body and knowing what's going on inside your body. And the most important company that can help you do that is Inside Tracker, literally tracking what's going on inside your body. Inside Tracker analyzes your body's data and provides you with a clear picture of what exactly is going on so that you can make changes to your diet or see what's going, working, what isn't. And how they do it is they analyze all the data from your blood, DNA, lifestyle, and fitness trackers to help you optimize your body and know what's really going on. So if you'd like to learn more or get 25% off the entire Inside Tracker store, go to Inside Tracker dot com slash adventure sports that is inside tracker dot com slash adventure sports inside tracker can get you ready and keep you ready for all your favorite adventure sports i am someone that's not quite smart enough or gonna take the time to figure out all the things that my body needs nutritionally um, and so i kind of like a, a cheat code of, of sorts almost something that can just get me what i need without me having to think about it 
And that's why I'm actually very excited to be talking about Athletic Greens because they have a daily powder that you can mix with water called AG1 that has 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day. I just do it early in the day, get it done with, and it makes you just feel more accomplished. I feel better. I have more energy. And no matter if you're on a special diet like keto, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, whatever, It doesn't interfere with any of that. Athletic Greens has figured it out because you could not afford this trying to put those 75 ingredients together yourself. They make it even easier by throwing in a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free Athletic Green AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash ASP. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash ASP to take ownership over your health. Pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. If you are looking for a New Year's resolution that's easy to keep, I have just the one. Resolve to help protect your identity with LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. LifeLock alerts you to potential threats to your identity. And if you have a problem, a U.S.-based restoration specialist will work to fix it. No one can prevent all identity theft, but help keep what's yours, yours, by resolving to protect your identity. Save up to 25% off your first year at lifelock.com slash aware. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Well, another thing you said that, you know, you made two, like, great, really, you know, all the points you're making are superior, um, and you said another one, which which uh, which happened to me. And you said that if it doesn't work out, and I'll I'll paraphrase you, you know, it can be really a horrible experience or an inglorious experience, or like why am I doing this and who does this and this is terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's exactly what I was going through on that climb. Ten steps into it, it became what you just said: a horrible experience. I was out of shape. I felt uncomfortable. I was maybe a little overweight at the time, and. It just was unfit, unready, unprepared. What I here's what I understood at the end of that trip. Okay, these people are insane. They are crazy. I don't know why they do this. There's nothing glorious about this. It's terrible. I'm sweaty. I stink. I smell. I'm unclean. I'm out of shape. My legs don't work. When I was done, I was I was I was like a super ball just bouncing around on my legs, you know, all over the place, and it took a week to recover. And uh, you know, just like reading into thin air, where you know, three months later, I thought maybe I'd give this a try. What happened to me was it was a big failure, really, in some ways on my part. Uh, I think three or four months passed, and I said, damn it, I can't let this happen. I've got to do this again. And I called him and said, we're going back next year. I'm not listening to you. I'm going to train. I know what to do. This is my wheelhouse and um, training anyway. I understand how to do these things. And so I did show up the next year in, in reasonably good shape. Um, and we did go up Middle Teton, which was quite a scramble. I did get to the top of that. But when I got back down, I'm going to concede that I once again thought, oh, my God, I'm not fit enough to do two of these things. <laughs> and again, I got lucky, if you want to call it that. Um, um, I got sick right after bagging uh, or summiting uh, Middle Teton. I, I felt a cold coming on. And I, this, this time, I, I you know, willingly left the mountain because I could feel this coming on. And I felt it was a blessing in disguise because I just didn't feel ready to go up the Grand. Um, and uh, as it turned out, it was, it was the right decision because I got really, really sick immediately. You know, it got worse by the time I was down uh, at the parking lot. And uh, over the next couple of days, it just got... Uh, got really, really bad. So I wouldn't have made it anyway that year. So it's just as well to get down. Um, and I was sort of embarrassed by that. It felt like it was another failure. Um, by this time, the only person who'd stand by me is my brother. We're blood, right? So, um, uh, his partner, uh, his climbing partner, you know, I, I, I told him we got to do this again next year. So 2001, 2002, and then finally in 2003, I, I truly amped up my training. I went berserk. I went crazy, and I was swimming uh, 15,000 yards a week in a master's program, and I was in the gym three days a week, uh, cranking very, very hard, nothing easy about it, and uh, three days a week in the California mountains. Uh, so I was committed this time to having no problem and went up again uh, with my brother only, and this time it, it truly was a glorious event. It was wonderful. Everything about it was fantastic. It was just a joy. And so my advice for everybody, always train for the event. Um, always know what you're getting into. Train for the event. Train harder 
than the event calls for so that the event itself is fun. I missed that by the time um, I was mountain climbing. I think I'd been out of stuff for too long and I'd kind of forgotten my way. That's how I finally approached it. I, I intended to have an event where where all of my training was going to be brutally hard on me such that when I got to Jackson for the third time, it was just going to be fun. And it worked out that way. It was a lot of fun. It was, it was great. But I spent months. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got it in the climb and the summit where they were all good. Um, I need to, before we move off of Grand Teton, you had a story about uh, after going through all of this, three attempts to get up there, dealing with illness <laughs> and not being prepared, uh, you finally get up there and you're looking out over the, the horizon and <laughs> And loving life and your accomplishments, but you uh, met somebody up there you were telling me about. I want you to, to relay that story a little bit. All right. I'll, I, uh, I'll try to run through this real quick. But, <laughs> well, it took me three years, really, to figure it out. And it's not like the Grand is the toughest climb in the world. It's not. But you, you've you got to be fit. You've got to train for these things. You can't just go do them. You know, there was a lot of work for me to get to this point where I'm finally, you know, climbing, camping, you know, climbing up a rope, getting to the lower saddle, abandoning our, our hiking bags, going light, getting ready to go technical and get all the way to the summit. And I've spent the night on the mountain. And finally, and it's steep. There, You mentioned exposure earlier. This is one incredible spot that um, you have to tie off on. And uh, you have to crawl through this uh, lip. Um, and the only thing that really makes you feel, if you can feel safe, crawling on the side of the mountain here on this lip is that this natural formation, um, hard to describe, but just if, if you can imagine um, a piece of scaffolding off the side of a building and imagine the building is the mountain and the scaffolding is his lip. And if you fall over and there's no railings there, there's just a scaffolding that, that, you know, the thing that the guys stand on when they're cleaning the windows on these buildings. Think of that as, you know, a lip that you have to crawl across to get over to continue the trail up to, yeah, to the summit. <laughs> yeah, I've read about it. It sounds oh, harrowing. It's harrowing. And the only thing that, ma- there's two things that make you feel relatively safe on that lip. It has a natural um, guardrail on it. So you could crawl through this thing and those little, you know, toothy rocks like the Sawtooth Mountain, the mini, mini version of, of toothy rocks here made you feel secure. But if you looked and, and it's about as wide as your shoulders, maybe a little wide. So don't don't get the notion that this is a nice wide thing that you get to crawl across. It isn't. <laughs> it's narrow. It's a plank. Uh, it's a plank, right. It's a plank. It's a little wider than a plank, but it's, an, it's enough to, you know, so you feel safe. Uh, and then you decide, well, I'm up here. I got to look over this thing and see what it looks down. And you look down to life-threatening exposure and you realize, you know, I'm on the edge of a mountain here, man. Uh, this is This is exhilarating and scary as hell. And it was both exhilarating. And scary as hell. So again, I'm walking you through this because I'm going through all of these experiences. I got to climb up things and rope up things, and this is a you know there's lots of routes to get to the top. I think you can even walk to the top, and there's a very serious route called Exum. And by the way, the year we went and I summited three months earlier, maybe a month earlier before we got there, <clears throat> there was a group of seven climbers going up Exum Ridge, and they were blown off it by a bolt of lightning. Just blew them off. It's a very serious mountain. There there there's a north side of it that's very hard to climb very technical exum ridge is technical and that that uh event was so serious they had to chopper they had to bring choppers in and 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 get people i think i think i mean a large number of people died in that event and just a couple survived it so it's not you know something you take lightly even though there might be a route you can walk up we didn't take that route we took a, a more technical route but certainly not the most technical because again you know i'm we have to f- he has to fit me into my experience plus what he thinks I can handle. So anyway, that ledge is a trip and everyone should should experience it. It's a lot of fun. Well, eventually we do some, we get to the top. It's been a lot of work. It's taken me really in a way years to get here. And I'm feeling like this is incredible, man. I'm at the top here. I'm looking out at the Jackson Hole Valley and look at all my comrades here. They've all made it up too. And I'm sitting on a rock feeling, you know, savoring this victory <laughs> of, of mine. A lot of work went into this, and and um, maybe up there five or six minutes, and some guy comes, you know, sort of traipsing in the camp, you know, just sort of bouncing in the camp, like, like I don't know what, like I I didn't understand this. This was like otherworldly to me to see someone come traipsing, just bouncy, bouncy, bouncy in the camp, and I looked at him and I thought, this doesn't look 
normal. This this looks abnormal, but I don't know. This guy's out of place. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't fit. This does not fit my experience. I've taken three years to get here. I just walked you through the effort it took me just to get where I'm telling this part of the story now. You know, a couple, you know, night on the mountains, under the stars, all this stuff, you know, failing for twice. And here I am at the top. And I think, I think my experience is the experience that it takes to get to the top. That's all I know is my experience. You know, you got to climb, you got to repel, you got to rope, you got to crawl, you've got to be exposed, you got to rope off, you've got to, you know, you got to train, you've got to do all this insane stuff. And this guy just bounces into camp. It was, it was, I, I, it just, I couldn't make sense of it. I, it's like scratching my head and I looked at him. He's maybe 20 feet from me. He comes in, he sits down, takes a very natural, casual position on a rock and he looks over the valley and he's just sort of looking at things. And I, I, I'm trying to add this up and it doesn't add up to me. And I look away and I, I sort of get back into my own experience. But I look back at him and next thing I know, he's got this little brown paper bag um, and, and, and he pulls out of his uh, backpack, his little day pack. And he pulls out a sandwich and is, and is casually – as you can imagine, to start gnawing away on a, on a sandwich there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, this really makes no sense to me. I mean, who comes up here as comfortable, as casual as this guy looks after what I've just been through and what it took for me to get here and just starts gnawing away on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And um, But I, I let it go. But it, again, it's still, it's still otherworldly to me. It doesn't fit my own experience, which I admit was narrow. But But I couldn't take it anymore. And so so I looked at him a third time and I go, hey, man, what's, what's up with you, man? What's the story? You, where's all your stuff? Wh- what's going on here? What are you doing? You don't, look like, you, know, you don't look like you should be here. You're in a pair of jogging shorts and a, and a, you know, a poly pro shirt. I mean, I've got my gear on. I've got my day pack. <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh, hey, uh, yeah, look at um, – yeah, I just, I just came up today. And I went, what do you mean you came up today? I I took me two days to get up here, and I. <laughs> you can't do that. It's not yeah, possible. You can't do that. How do you? You don't. Well, I, I just again. I just completely outside of my understanding of the laws of, of physics and everything else. And she goes, "Oh, I I live here. You know, I uh, yeah. I just I just came up today. I I got off uh, I got off on the trail at about uh, three thirty this morning, and uh, and I came up. I said, well, even even if you did that, I mean, how, how could you do that? And he goes, oh, I ran up. You know, I just ran up. I said, what do you mean you ran up here? I just spent the night in the moraines. I spent three years trying to get here. I trained like a madman to get up the top here. And you just started at three in the morning and you ran up this thing? So he just explained to me. He goes, yeah, I live here. This, this, this is what I do. You know, I do this once a month or whenever I feel like it, when I want something to do. It's sort of like, you know, the way I think about going into my backyard swimming pool is how this guy thinks about climbing, you know, or going up the Grand. He just shows up and does it. You know, and I, uh, you know, if I, it's a hot summer day and I want to cool down, you know, I just put on a pair of swimming trunks and go fall in the pool and, and, and float around and do nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That was his equivalent of floating around and doing nothing. That was just his gig. That's what he did. And I got it, but I started thinking, well, I mean, I, if he can do it, I can do it. And then I said, no, 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 no. That's enough. No, no, no. Good. You, you, you came to Summit. You didn't come to compete. The object for you was just to get to the top. You finally did. You had a great experience. He lives here. It's his thing. It's what he does. That's, that's it. That's the end of it. We're not going to do this. We're not going to you know, up the ante here. We don't need to do that. So uh, that's sort of what happened there. It was just a, the juxtaposition between what it took me to finally get to the top, the whole story. Um, and uh, ultimately, the year you know, the year I did some, and all of the effort and work and training I did, so I'd have a great experience. Next to this guy, who just basically you know grabbed a walking stick and just showed up with lunch. <laughs> decided decided to go for a day hike. Yeah, flip flops. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised. I it, it would have it, now that I understand everything, it would have made even more sense if he did have flip flops. I'm surprised <laughs> this didn't kick those off. But you know, right. amazing guy, amazing you know lungs, amazing amazing capacity, and of course, <clears throat> it helps to live at altitude, which you know Jackson isn't you know the, the highest place, but. Um, it helps, it helps doing that yeah, kind of thing, which he does regularly. And so it was a funny story because it just didn't match my experience at all. And so yeah, right. that's that story. Well, so naturally you walked over, pushed him off the edge, and then <laughs> headed back happily down to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, I didn't know what to do. I just said, hey, man, you're an animal. I, that, that's a great story. I'm going to tell everybody this story. And I, I, that's awesome. You got a chuckle out of it. but 
All right. So in your um, your training and all of your swimming in, in college and Olympic trials and whatnot, you had actually gotten into uh, supplements, taking supplements to to aid in your training. So I being a weekend warrior and many of us, uh, you know, in the audience being weekend warriors probably aren't real familiar with supplements and what the benefits can be. So do me a favor and educate me a little bit on, on the benefits of supplements. And I know that, uh, we can let this lead into your company biotropics. And, uh, so tell us what that is and, uh, and what it is you do. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I think my my quest for, you know, look, athletes are always seeking biological edge. It's something that they can do legally and safely to help boost their performance. It's a it's a never ending quest for for just about all athletes, um, and um, probably the people that are most well known for it are the bodybuilding crowd. And of course, in earlier days, they were doing illegal things, but today they're really good about doing safe and natural things. But swimmers do it, runners do it, all athletes do it. They're all they're all looking for a way to boost their performance. And my experience really began in in high school. Um, I was having great success, as I mentioned earlier, in my senior year, and I started looking for, <laughs> ready for ways, you know, to to improve my performance and try to get an edge. You know, a lot of tough people out there. Um, and uh, you know, when you're working out, you're you're always saying, "Am I working hard enough?" You know, and, and probably I'm not working hard enough. There's someone in Texas, there's someone in Florida, there's someone somewhere in my event, you know, working harder than me. And so you're always you're always doing two things. You're always trying to find a new ceiling to push through, of of uh, of effort. Um, uh, I I tend, you know, I, I'm saying effort. I'm being sort of kind <laughs> with the word. Um, <laughs> Typically, we think of it as like just pain and torture um, because that's really what it's like to train at that level. But really, whether whether it's, you know, you're doing what I was doing or a weekend warrior or a triathlete or someone in between who's, who's also working. I mean, these all, these, all these people work really hard. They're just different levels of it. Um, so you're always looking for, you know, a way to train harder and and uh, a way to support that too, a way to, to get through it. Um, and so, I, you know, I'll cut to the chase here. I between high school and finishing my career as an athlete, I tried everything under the sun. And I really found uh, some things I knew were good for me, and I would take them, even though I didn't necessarily feel any benefit. And there's a reason to do that. No, no time really to go into that here. But there is a reason to take things that you know are good for you, even if you don't necessarily feel the benefit. But when, Because um, it will do other things uh, for you that are good that you don't feel um, uh, from it. But um, uh, what, I, what I did was... Uh, tried everything. And at one point I was taking up to 30, 35 pills a day. And I just quit after a long period of time of doing it because I felt like it's just taking all this stuff. I'm trying every combination of off the shelf stuff and just really nothing worked for me. Now, let me just add before I go on that supplement taking is highly personal. So uh, what works for me might not work for you. What works for 20 people might not work for the next guy. Creatine, for example, is a pretty well studied um, supplement, and it's got some pretty solid um, studies behind it. Suggests that it really does work. So I, I'm a big proponent of, of that sort of thing. But I took it. Uh, in fact, I was taking it when I was uh, preparing to go up the Grand for my final push. When I mentioned earlier, you know, I was doing weight training and hiking with weight and and swimming. Uh, 15,000 yards a week. And it was during that time I was taking creatine and I got no benefit from it. So like my early days in supplement uh, taking, uh, I just stopped. And creatine, despite the fact that I know a lot of people that have success with it and feel it helps them recover better, I, I just felt like it just didn't work for me. It was a lot of effort, a lot of drinking you know, powder and loading and preloading and maintenance. And I just wasn't getting any bang for it. So um, and, and that, was, of course, was later uh, in, in my life when I was doing that. But just to make the point that uh, it's very important for everyone to know it's worth trying things if they sound like they make sense and if, they're, and if they look safe and natural or if they are safe and natural. Go ahead. Give it a try. You might find something works. You might find it doesn't. But just want to throw that caveat out there that things are worth trying um, uh, whether or not they have scientific or clinical studies behind it if they look like they make sense because oftentimes you'll find that things do. And uh, athletes are usually pretty good at passing the word along for those things that work and those things that don't. Well, I gave up on my off-the-shelf concoctions and, and uh, mixtures of this and that. I'd had it. It was just too many 
supplements for what I felt was no benefit. And when I was uh, uh, going for my next run, my next Olympic trial run, um, I had hooked up with a health practitioner in California. I was in California at that time. And very, very good in the nutritional area. And he wanted to be part of my Olympic run. And uh, he wanted to, you know, do chiropractic work and nutritional work. And I said I hadn't really had much success with nutrition, but um, fine, let's let's have at it. I'm, I'm always open. And um, he uh, he had great, he just had great success. All I can do is, is, is at this point, just cut to the chase. The, the combination of things that he did, which were not off the shelf, they were, he thought things through. He thought about, my level of training, um, where I was training, um, you know, how I was training, the events I was training in, and put together some concoctions that really, for me personally, made a huge difference. And it was sort of remarkable. I'd never felt, again, I really want to emphasize for me because I, I don't claim, I want to be transparent about these things. Not As I said earlier, not everything works for everybody, but this did work for me. And at a pretty hard working engine at the time and I was just very happy to finally have something that seemed to kick me up very hard into another notch of being able to train at a higher level, higher aerobic capacity, better endurance. My recovery was re phenomenal. I would do a two hour workout in the morning, go home, have breakfast and go right back out on, on my three session day, go right back out and have a two hour uh, uh, hard uh, gym routine. And I can distinctly remember leaving the gym, not even being out of the weight room yet, never mind leaving the gym, not even being out of the weight room yet and thinking, stopping in fact and saying, geez, did I work hard enough? Did I do the work I'm supposed to do? And this is not the way it's supposed to feel. So again, emphasis, um, I had uh, just a huge benefit from it. It helped my training dramatically. It helped my recovery dramatically. Um, and, uh, uh, and it helped my competing dramatically. And so... I became a believer in custom formulations, and uh, uh, so that that sort of ended uh, when my career as a swimmer ended. I wasn't thinking in those days of going into the supplement space. I was thinking of other things, had other ideas on my mind, and and pursued those. And then uh, a couple of years ago, um, someone I know entered the space, developed a product for athletes that I thought was a very good product, but and I want to be very respectful to them because they're smart people, they're good, and they're having enormous success. But I felt, my own personal belief, it was the wrong product for athletes. It was a very good product, but not the right product for athletes seeking a biological edge. Um, and I thought, you know, I have a product that worked for me that did produce a biological edge. And I love the sports scene. You know, you've heard my mountain climbing stories. I, I've scuba dived. Of course, I was a... Uh, competing at a high level and swimming for a long, long time. I played football. I mentioned these things earlier. I did lots of stuff. And I, and my colleagues, I was very, very fortunate to be around a lot of Olympians, uh, despite the fact that I didn't make it. A lot of my friends are, are very high level Olympians and coaches and from many, many different Olympics from, I mean, all the way back to, uh, you know, the seventies into the eighties. Uh, my coach here in Austin, Texas is an 88 Olympian. So, I love that scene. I love that crowd. I really understand them. I know what they're going through because I've been through it too. I understand. I really feel like I completely get any any athletic scene, even if it's something I don't do. I get the work it takes to compete at the highest levels. And I also get, you mentioned Weekend Warriors. Well, what do you think I was when I was a you know, doing my so-called mountain climbing mm -hmm, stuff. Right. I was, right, right. I was effectively the same thing when I, when I was doing that. Um, so um, I decided that I, as I say, I, I, I knew I had the right product and I decided to recreate it and augment it a little bit, add a couple of modern day ingredients to it and bring it to market because I love to help people. Uh, it, it's just a blast to see people perform better, to get positive responses from people when they use it and to be part of helping them succeed and uh, get to their next level, whether it's a guy like me trying to get up the grand or you know, someone who's speed walking or jogs three or four days a week, anyone who's breathing and anyone who's working is going to benefit from it. Um, and at least I believe that. That's my strong, sincere belief because it works so well for me. And I know that if your body's working, you're getting some, some engine-like performance going on, um, you'll have good uptake with this product. And uh, it does, it does some, some very neat things. It's built around uh, uh, 
uh, higher oxygenation, so carrying higher levels of oxygen to hardworking muscles, uh, a safe, natural, gentle stimulation of uh, red blood cells to create more oxygen carrying capacity. Um, it's packed with a very, very high grade, maybe the I think the highest grade uh, uh, vitamin supplements, um, in, in, including in particular the B suite of vitamins, the B12, 6, and 3, which are all energy oriented um, um, uh, uh, vitamins that uh, are all about, uh, um, you know, again, oxygenation, creating energy, ATP production, and, um, and there's also a product in there that has, is, is very well studied and very well accepted um, as a uh, uh, immune, uh, immune support. And I wasn't going to put that in there, but I found out that uh, it did two things, and, and so, so two things occurred to me. Number one, athletes who are training hard usually are, always, are often fighting this fine line between sickness and health. They're always on this edge of, you know, being great performers and also, you know, catching a cold easier than the next guy because right. they tend to, yeah, because they tend to be broken down quite a bit. Um, they have to work through that. So, um, so I did put that in there for that. And it also, as I mentioned a second ago, has um, uh, a history of also gently and naturally helping the body produce a few more red blood cells to increase oxygen um, flow to the, to the muscle. So that's the idea behind the product. And I brought it to market because, as I say, because, um, well, I just felt I really had a, a, a better product and uh, I wanted to put it out there. I wanted to help people have better weekends, uh, better than I had going up the grand, which I think I described earlier, um, which I wasn't taking at that time. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, to help everybody, uh, that's moving around in particular, you know, uh, weekend warriors and moving up from there into the elite level athletes. So, um, that's why Biotropic came about. And, um, um, some of my good friends are, I've only, it's a singular product right now. It's, it's the product that helped me do what I did when I was training for the Olympics in my, in my effort. Um, but we're bringing forth, uh, more custom formulations. As I say, it's an inaugural one-off product at the moment. I'm very proud of it. Um, but as I say, we're developing other custom formulations that have had a history of working for athletes so that uh, people who are looking for, for other things, um, maybe a, an exotic protein, which uh, we, we've got a fantastic exotic protein that we're going to bring to market that <laughs> most people are going to wince at when they hear about it. But uh, very, very high level, cleanest level of uh, protein you can get out there. Um, so, so unique and some exotic things that are unusual that uh, – that have a history of working. And uh, once again, with that said, I'm not an infomercial. I want to just one more time point out that what works for me may not work for you, but I, I think the only way to find anything out is to do what I did and probably a little bit to some degree what you've done and other people like us have done. you got to try to find out and eh, something doesn't work, it doesn't work. You move on. But if you find something that does work, it's worth sticking it out because it can make your hiking, your swimming, your running, your triathlete work, whatever you do, mountain climbing, a lot more fun. And um, especially when you get to the event, like I'd mentioned to you earlier, I tend to train very, very hard for my events and do all the pain and work you know, in workouts so that when I get to the event, whether it's mountain climbing or running or whatever the thing is, um, that that is easier for me to do. So it helps people achieve that, I believe, helps people achieve that sort of uh, level of training and fitness. So um, it's a great accompaniment, and I appreciate you asking about it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it makes a lot of sense, and I've always been a little bit curious about uh, supplements. Like I said, you know, I, I look at it from the weekend warrior uh, standpoint, the vantage point. What is it that would, what would somebody that says, okay, I'm going to go climb a 14er this weekend and I'm active, I, I hike, but I'm not out there on a daily basis. I'm not competing um, and exercising every day for that. I have a job like most people. What is it that I would experience by taking a supplement like this? Um, is it an instant thing? Do you have to kind of prep for it and lead up, you know, with a week or two of, of taking it before you notice the, uh, the benefits? Well, it's – okay, so that's a really good question. Um, it, it does have a lift in it. So if you were to take two – let's say you, you, you took two before you went up, you'd feel a lift from it. You would definitely feel more energy. But the idea behind it is that if you're actually training or working towards something, that you take it on a continual basis, your body uptakes it. So it's, it's consistently in your body during the training process. So it helps lift the actual training to make whatever vent you're aiming for better. So for example – I'm training right now, uh, as you know, 
uh, well, I'm training for two things right now. Uh, uh, top on that list is um, an attempt at the Continental Divide Trail. We'll get to why that trail as opposed to the other two in a second. Um, and also I have a Ragnar relay race. Those are 200-mile street relay races that they do all over the country. Um, and so in my effort to get trained up for that, I have to start running again and doing a lot of conditioning work. And so it's perfect to have that in my body because you do get a lift from it. But as I train, it helps my training. It lifts my training also. So as, a, uh, as, I, as I move down the road toward those events, it also allows me to train a little harder, more effectively, get more oxygen uh, and more blood to my muscles. I, I should have mentioned that. There's a vasodilator in there too, which expands the arteries and blood vessels naturally in your body. Well-studied product that does this. So you get, you get more of these vitamins. Uh, I know I'm backing up a little bit, but it's an important point on the product and why it helps training and why it helps competition and also why it would help you on a weekend walk. You'd get both the lift from it, but you also get this natural vasodilation effect, which, which produces, um, as I say, a, uh, an expanded artery and blood vessels to get more blood to your working muscles. So yes, you would feel a lift on the weekend, but you're going to get the best benefit from it if you're aiming towards something and you're taking it regularly. And I, and I, uh, when people purchase the product online, uh, the last thing they get in the uh, shopping cart is a button that says how to take. And so I offer how to take guidelines for who you are and what you're training for. Of course, you know best, whoever you are, what you, especially if you have supplement experience, supplement taking experience, you'll know what to do. But I offer guidelines anyway, and it could be anywhere from one to five pills a day, depending again. Five would obviously be for a guy uh, training at the highest levels in, in and, and ripping off, you know, eight, 9,000 calories a day, right. um, you know, all the way down to someone who's just walking around the block. Um, I have had some, one, one of the health practitioners that's testimonial of the product is a former Olympian also. Um, and his own view is that people should take it whether they're training or not because of the vitamin content that's in it and the health product, the value of the health side of it, um, uh, beyond its lift for athletes. Um, that's his view. So, um, Maybe I maybe um, I should point that out too, but but really it wasn't designed with that in mind. I didn't have that in mind. I had it in mind to help people as they're aiming toward a goal. But yeah, it it would definitely be something. I think if you took before a hike, you'd feel the lift from you. You will feel a lift from it. it. There's no there's no caffeine and there's no there's no stimulants in there, but you'll get a lift from it. Yeah, that definitely helps. So I'll have to check it out myself. It's uh, I, I'm not getting any younger, so I figure uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything that's natural and safe that helps, then uh, why not? You know, if you can make your uh, your your adventure more pleasurable <laughs> because of it, sure. then I'm all for it. That's cool. Yeah, I think anyway. Yeah, any way to help lift training to me makes a difference. And, uh, you know, I wish that when I was training for that grand trip with all that work I was doing mm -hmm. that I had thought to to go, hey, 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 what what's wrong with you? Why don't you put this stuff together again that you did back when you were training for the Olympics? And it didn't even occur to me. So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You might have bolstered your immune system and made it up that second time instead of walking <laughs> down with a cold. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, <laughs> that's all behind me now. But, you know, there there, there are some of those coming up here some more of those, uh, those clients coming up here in the future. Right. Okay. So where do people go to check out, uh, biotropic and, oh, uh, but, the, uh, uh, products that you have? Yeah. Thanks again. I appreciate your asking. It's, uh, it's biotropic labs.com. So B I O T R O P I C labs, biotropic labs.com. And as I say, it's a one-off product right now. Um, uh, the supplements page only takes you to a single, uh, product, but, uh, pay attention to it because, I'll slowly be building out uh, a menu, uh, first showing what's going to be coming in the future, and then one by one adding additional products. I'm working on a uh, on a nootropic too because it seems um, while athletes want cognitive edges, there's lots of executives out there and race car drivers and chess players and people executives that that want uh, uh, cognitive enhancements too. So um, um, uh, I've got a I've got got a custom formulation for that too that's coming out. Yeah, I could see using that for my work day in front of a computer. <laughs> there might be some benefit there for me as well. Yeah, you know what's really interesting about what you just said. Um, my competitor who came out with a product, it was a nootropic, and that's why I felt, look, I've been there, done that, and while athletes make mistakes and they have mental lapses, they don't need cognitive edges. They need biological edges because, by and large, athletes show up ready to compete laser focused, ready, ready to pound it. That's how they are. Again, uh, they make mistakes, but 
on a day that an athlete's going to make a mistake, it's my own personal belief, having done it for so many years at a high level, that no amount of nootropic at when it's a physical thing, despite there's a lot of brain work, you've got to manage a race, you've got to hit your turns right, you've, you've got to know how to get through a triathlon properly. You can't just do these things. You've got to think about them while you're doing them. But they already know how to do that. They already show up ready, right, and, 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 and fired up to go, and, and they know how to take care of that. Uh, and that's why I produced or brought back biotropic and didn't initially go with a nootropic for biological uh, functions. But you just said something really interesting, which is, you know, you're in front of your computer screen. Now think about the difference. When you're competing, it's a, it's an engine function. It's a biological heavy engine function. You, you need you need all your pistons oiled up and working well and grinding through. And of course, you have to think through how to manage a race. But when you're in front, in front of a, a computer screen, it's a completely different experience. It's all brain. So you make a very good point. You know, when you're, when you're in a, a high capacity thinking mode, that's where uh, I believe a new tropic will really step up and help you out. Um, I don't think I finished the thought. Whereas uh, with, with an athlete, I think if they're off on a given day, the only difference that a nootropic is going to make is they're still going to make that mistake. They're still going to be off. They're not going to be any better. They're just going to be more aware and 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 more uh, highly conscious of the error that they made. So I don't think that higher cognitive functions help the athlete gain a competitive edge. Bio, 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 uh, biological um, functions do, whereas – the nootropics, I do think, help executives and guys in front of computer screens all day long and people who have to really engage with their brain and aren't thinking about their their quads or their lats or their biceps. And I went on a little bit there, but I just wanted to make that point because because I think you, you made a good point. Oh, yeah. No, that makes complete sense. Well, cool. So go check out biotropiclabs.com and uh, see what it is uh, that Craig has got on offer and learn a little bit about it and maybe it can benefit you as well. Okay, so let's dive back in and we'll, uh, we'll finish this up with your uh, CDT ambitions. And I know you talked about uh, eventually uh, parlaying that into the, the Triple Crown if it goes well. So tell me a little bit about why the CDT uh, first, at least, and what it is you're, you're doing to prepare for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, I think that's a great question because I, you know, I love talking about this. But the, the reason I, I aimed and got the CDT, the Continental Divide Trail, and my cross here is just because up until two weeks ago, I'd never heard of it. Up until, you know, I, uh, you and I had had a, an email communication and mentioned I might be doing this, and I'd never heard of it. I knew about the AT, and I knew about the Pacific Crest because I'd mentioned my cousin who was a, a, a wilderness uh, rescue guy living in the mountains for years, you know, helping people like me off of it <laughs> when, when I'd get into trouble. <laughs> um, he had hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, so you know, I, I, I was aware of that quite some time ago, uh, back into the 90s. And, of course, as I mentioned earlier, too, and you and I talked about, we both know about the AT, AT being New Englanders. And the AT has been in my crosshairs for many years. I've wanted to do it. I've just never picked the time, spotted the time. So it's always been a goal of mine. Um, and I know it's a six-month, and I, I intend to do a, a through hike. I want to go all the way through. I don't want to, uh, short, short of life getting in the way. Um, yeah, sometimes you just have to leave these things because something something real comes up. Sure. Yeah, and you have to leave. Um, but the reason I ended up thinking, whoa, I, I think I want to do the CDT is because I just stumbled upon it. I didn't know there was a third you know, trail, and I didn't know there was a triple crown. And I thought, darn, wow. I mean, these are all great trails. And the reason the CDT really stuck out for me is that despite the fact it starts maybe in the along with the Pacific Crest Trail in the worst location, which is southern you know, New Mexico at the Mexican border, because I, I don't have my – I'm learning all this stuff. I've got a year to get it together. I have plenty of time. I'm training now for a departure next year because if, if, I, if I remember correctly, I believe it's a June departure, uh, a May or June departure. And so you can imagine what the temperatures are like. Well, they're like what they are right now. They're, <laughs> they're Darn <over> hot. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So uh, – but – the CDT happens to go through some of my favorite terrain. Uh, it goes through Wyoming. It goes through Montana. It goes through Colorado. And I love those places. I love those mountains. And I know that I'm asking for a tougher out-of-the-gate experience. And, and experts out there, based on the research, re research that I've done, will say that's all open to debate. But, you know, as to which is harder and which is not. My understanding, uh, the Pacific 
I'm going to put everything in quotes here, but the PCT is a little easier because it's more gentle. It slopes. It's still hard. You're going to be in snow. You're going to be cold. You're going to be hot. You can have all sorts of experiences, and that's a that's a 2,000 or 2,500 mile trail. It's not it's not easy, but if you think in relative terms, it's it's a little it's 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 gentler from what I've read so far. And I hope any of you out there listening who've done this aren't laughing too hard at me if I've got it all wrong. Uh, I concede. I'm a novice. I'm learning. So give me a, <laughs> give me a, give me a pass if I'm screwing up. No, here I think this. you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah. Um, the AT is a hard trail, but it's a tunnel and it's social. It's a highly social trail. Now you, you can, you can hardly hike that alone, except for some areas. There's a hundred mile section up in Maine where, you know, you're going to be covered in bugs and, um, there's nothing around, but basically, you, you know, you're never more than I think three days on average with some exception away from a town and, you know, uh, and it's, and it's while it's got some very hard parts, um, Pennsylvania I hear is a son of a gun. It's all rocks and it's just something you curse all the way through it. And uh, I know all about that because I did that all the way up Mount Moran quietly when uh, you know when I was failing on that first trip in Wyoming. Um, but the eight in the AT is a bunch of work. It's a 2,100 mile trail. It's five and a half to six months to get through. But when I read about the CDT. Um, it's longer. It's anywhere from 2,500 to 3,100 miles, depending on how you go. It's a bit more wild and woolly. It's it's less settled. It's they say 70% complete. So so 30% is a lot of uncompleted um, trail. Mm-hmm. Right. So so I, I I find it a little more challenging. Um, I, I I like the idea of the terrain, uh, better. I don't like the idea of starting off at 102 degree heat in New Mexico, but you know, I love the idea of hiking through terrain that I love steamboat Springs, as I mentioned, Colorado, uh, uh, Wyoming, Utah. I think I cannot remember if Idaho plays any part in this. Um, uh, just don't remember off the top of my head, but, and so, you know, I, I thought this, this is harder in my own view and my early estimation of things. And again, uh, Disclaimer, I'm still learning. I'm reading about this stuff. Um, But I do want to make it clear I do come from a hiking and I don't do this as an utter novice. Um, And most people who do any of these trails do them the first time as long, you know, haul hikers. Uh, They're inexperienced at that sort of thing, which I definitely am. I am not inexperienced at uh, using a map, topography, camping. I I grew up doing that stuff. So uh, a good deal of it is in my wheelhouse. I think the toughest part of this for me is not going to be managing snow and post holing and um, uh, the usual sort of camping things. It's going to be not getting lost um, and it's going to be um, time, you know, the distance, you know, f- managing five to six months of, of, uh, of trail hiking. And so I guess I finally decided it was time to do the AT and figure it out and stop waiting for the right time and just do it. Just get out there and get it done. If it's something I've wanted to do for many, many, many years, what what am I waiting for? As you mentioned a minute ago, I'm not getting any younger either. Right. And uh, it sure as heck is not going to get any easier. So um, that's what I'm aiming for. Um, and, I'm, and I'm taking a year to prepare. That's my usual routine. When, uh, well, maybe four or five months is my usual routine to prepare for something arduous. But this is bigger and badder and tougher and longer than anything I've done. So I'm taking a good long time to get ready. I've got to do a lot of um, uh, practice prep work. So I've already lined up an October camping trip. I I mentioned my brother and his partner taking me up the Grand earlier. I already called uh, his partner up. um, And we've already scheduled some practice events in the White Mountains. So we'll go out. um, He's a very, very very, very experienced mountaineer and camper. And so I'll go out and be a sponge and learn whatever else I need to learn from him. And I'll do this several times in the cold and I'll do it in the heat um, before I go hit the trail. And, and then I, I, I thought, well, look, at, if you're going to do the CDT, you might as well do all of them because that's the longest of them. And there's some part of that plays into my psychology too. If I do the hardest and longest one first, it isn't like the rest are going to be easy. They're not going to be easy. No, not but, at all. Yeah, they're not going to be easy. This is all hard work. But but psychologically, in the way my mind operates, I'll know I killed off the hardest one first. And just no matter how hard the next ones are, um, I'll just know I got the hardest one done first. Okay, yeah, easier said than done. The minute I'm you know, 2,000 miles or, or 1,500 miles into the AT, it'll all feel like 3,000 miles. So, um, 
you know, it's all, it's all going to hurt. It's all going to be an effort, but, uh, I just figured I'd bag them all and I do them all in, um, in a three year period. So if I, it, or maybe, maybe not three years, <laughs> maybe, maybe five years. Three. <laughs> we got to set a goal anyway, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, like I say, I like for this sort of thing, my intention is to, to train a year before I do it. So right now I'm, I'm, I'm on a good schedule. I'll start next, you know, May or June. I'll play with that a bit. I'll actually try to start a little earlier so I don't hit the heat in uh, New Mexico as bad as I would. But of course that brings up problems in the San Juans and, and, uh, and get near too early and Montana too early. So you, you gotta, you can't, you can't just do these things. You gotta plan them out. But when that's done, I'll have, uh, you know, if it's a six month run, then it's six months, you know, till next summer. I don't know if that's enough time to recover and get ready. So, um, maybe this takes up to six years to, to do. I, I, I really don't know. I, I gotta knock one off and, and see what happens. Yeah. I'm certainly capable of, if I set my mind to it, uh, and I complete the CDT um, and um, uh, get it done of, of going out again six months later with a solid three months of doing nothing, <laughs> no training, no practice, no anything, um, and then maybe getting ready to do that again. So there, there you have it. That's that's sort of how it came about. I just I just shifted over to the CT, CDT because I hadn't heard about it, read about it, and loved the way it sounded, and I wanted to do the harder one first. Oh, yeah. It seems like an amazing trail. I have not hiked on any portions of it yet, but I've learned a ton about it. We've had, I think, three different people on this show talking about the CDT. Um, in fact, for inspiration, if you haven't found them yet, go to our backpacking, camping, and hiking section of our podcast categories, and you'll find them all there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I've... I've been fortunate enough to to uh, be with folks from the, the Continental Divide Trail Coalition on uh, multiple occasions and learned quite a bit about the trail. And this trail is pretty young by comparison. There are uh, There is a, a good 30% that is still unfinished. There's a lot of, of the trail that's actually still on dirt road where they're trying to move that off onto uh, into the wilderness, onto single track. Um, there's a lot of areas where if you don't have your navigation skills and, and proper maps and stuff with you that, you know, you very, very likely will get lost. So it's a, it's a challenge there as well. It's not just a physical challenge, but you have to know how to navigate. So I think it's a, it's a ambitious and a, a great thing to, to set out to do. And, uh, can't wait to hear about your accomplishments and how it all pans out. And, uh, we'll definitely get you back on the show to, to share some experiences from it too. My intent is, and I hope it doesn't slow me down, to log it and uh, you know, when I stop, try to try to do some updates and po- posts along the way so that it can sort of be a real-time event. And um, yeah, listen, what can you tell me? If you're part of, that's amazing, you're part of the coalition. I didn't know that. What what can you tell me? What do I need to know? Let, let me get some education here. <laughs> well, I'm not part of the coalition. <laughs> I've just been, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to go down to presentations by them and have a few of their people on our show and uh, and listen to it. In fact, uh, one of the things, look through our blog post on our site. Um, just, uh, just last week, I put up a, a video of Liz Thomas uh, talking about her new book, and it's the... Uh, it's the, the basically the best day hikes on the, the CDT. It's a whole guidebook, a pack book um, to tell you about if you're just going to go up and do some day hikes or, or a couple couple nights on the CDT, where the best places are to go. Um, and that was really a, a kind of an informative presentation just to listen to, you know, to them talk about how the CDT came about and what they're currently doing to to further develop it. So, um Definitely a lot of good information there to to check out. And I would, you know, go to the CDTC uh, website, cdtc.org or Continental Divide Trail Coalition.org, either one, um, to learn more about it because there's a lot of information there as far as uh, planning and navigation and all that good stuff. But I, uh, when it comes to the CDT, I'm a, I'm a noob. Like I said, I haven't put boots on the trails yet, but I think I uh, at least I'm going to pick up some of the, the day hikes this summer with my kids and and go experience some of it and get the bug to do the whole thing. And then like you find the time to, to take off and, and do the whole through hike. That's a, it's a lot of time to set aside, but I think it'd be amazing. It is a lot of time. Um, and you know, you really, you really have to plan for it and get, you know, you have to have a good support team. You really, you can't do it alone. You really need a good support team. Um, but I, it'd be great if you could do it too. And I also wanted to point out, you know, what a great program you guys have. It's very inspirational and motivational. You guys are great. Uh, great podcasters with great information, very, very inform- informative stuff. And, um, you know, I, I love what you do and I hope you keep doing it for a long time to come. Well, absolutely. 
Whitney LaRufa. I'm actually going to be catching up with him on Thursday, and he's on the CDT right now. And uh, wow, we're trying to arrange it so the way he's up in Grand Lake, uh, we're going to do an interview with him. So I bring that up because that's how it's fun. Um, if we can get you while you're on the trail and uh, share some of your experiences from there, right on the trail, and and when they're fresh in the memory, that's some of the fun, uh, some of the best times to to talk to somebody is when they're they're living that in the moment. So we'll Absolutely. definitely have to try and touch base then. Oh, what a great idea. Yeah, what a great idea. I'd love to do that. So uh, that's another motivation to do it, just to share the experience <laughs> with uh, with you and uh, with, with hopefully people that want to hear about it too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, good yeah. deal, Craig. Man, it's been a, a blast talking to you and learning about your uh, your your past and your planned, uh, planned future about biotropics and uh, uh, I am definitely intrigued with the supplement uh, thing. I think it's something I'd like to look into personally. And uh, if anybody else out there is, is interested in it, go visit uh, Craig over at biotropiclabs.com and uh, see if you can get a little information and see if it's right for you as well. So, Craig, it's been awesome having you on the show. I appreciate your time. Oh, the pleasure's been all mine. I really appreciate it. You're a gracious host, and you've put up with me for, for quite a bit here. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah, the pleasure's <laughs> all mine. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Well, you have a good evening then. You too. Take care now. Bye-bye. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. Gearheads know that some projects need so many parts, it feels like you need a whole storage unit just to store them. That's what eBay Motors' 122 million parts are for. Think of it as your virtual parts garage. They've always got the right fitment at the right prices. Use the eBay Motors app or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride.